the Buddha often talks about mindfulness as a form of protection. It protects you from doing unskillful things because you have a fund of knowledge. And if you're mindful, you have it at your fingertips. You can remember things that you've done in the past, things you've learned, things you've heard, and the lessons you've learned. And then you can apply them to what you're doing now. Without that kind of memory, without that fund of knowledge that you can call to mind, you're helpless at the whim of whatever emotion comes passing through. So we try to be mindful, and we try to be mindful in the right way. Establishing our awareness right here. Because if you're off wandering in other thought worlds, you can forget a lot of things. The lessons you've learned may not be relevant. You can pretend that they don't even exist. It's one of the reasons why they have those questions, what would the Buddha do? What would a John Munn say? If you're still in the present moment, conscious that you're practicing, it's easier to call those things to mind if you're off wandering in sensual fantasies. It's very easy to put up a wall, a wall of forgetfulness, a wall that tries to make the fact of the Buddha's existence, the fact of the Buddha's teachings, the facts of the Ajans and their teachings, tries to make them irrelevant. And that's when you're left helpless, left defenseless. Because the biggest dangers in life come not from things outside, not from viruses, not from other people's actions. They come from what you are doing. And that's one of the first lessons of mindfulness, right mindfulness. Yes, you want to look into your suffering, you look at the dangers, look at what you're doing to create them, and then try to protect yourself. The different analogies the Buddha gives give some ideas of the different ways in which mindfulness is a protection, can, can provide protection. For example, the one of the, the man whose head is on fire. Mindfulness there keeps reminding you, you've got to focus on this above everything else. Putting out the fire. You can't get distracted by other things. Certain things are urgent, certain things have to take priority. In this case, of course, the priority is the state of your mind, the qualities of the mind that you're acting on, the qualities of the mind that you're trying to abandon. So give the issues of the mind top priority. That's the lesson of right mindfulness. That's the kind of protection that that image calls to mind. There's the image of the gatekeeper. He's guarding a frontier fortress. There are enemies about, so he has to be very careful who he lets into the fortress, who he doesn't. Here the protection is Recognizing what's going to be unskillful in your mind, recognizing what's going to be skillful, and then acting on it, acting on that knowledge. When you're sitting here meditating and the mind starts wandering off into a fantasy, into thoughts of ill will, thoughts of restlessness. All too often we don't recognize these things as unskillful. The mind can tell itself, oh, this sensual object here is really attractive, it's worthy of my, my desire, or that person did something really awful that was worthy of my ill will. We don't even think about desire, ill will, we just go for the, the feeling. And we side with it, we take it on, we identify ourselves with it. The image of the gatekeeper is to remind you, you have to keep asking yourself, what comes up in the mind is not necessarily going to be to your advantage. There are things in the mind that could destroy your, your goodness, could destroy your well-being. So you've got to be very careful about who you let in, who you don't. You have to look at things in terms of where they're coming from, what emotion they're coming from, and where they lead. 
Remember how the Buddha got into the path the very first time, when he divided his thoughts into two types, skillful and unskillful, and then from there decided what he was going to think, what he was not going to think. His likes and dislikes didn't get into the issue at all. That's how you protect yourself, reminding yourself that your thoughts do have their consequences. And so you have to be careful about which ones you allow into the mind, which ones you embroider, which ones you take on, and which ones you put aside. There's a similar image, the sim simile of the quail. The quail, if it stays in the field, is safe because it can hide behind rocks and the hawk can't get it. If it wanders out away from the field where there are no rocks to hide behind, then the hawk can get it. You've got to keep your thoughts within bounds, your interests within bounds. This applies all throughout the day. All too often we forget that the things we think about in the course of the day will have an impact on the mind that lasts well beyond the time the thought has passed. And you can think about thoughts in the morning that can make it very difficult for the mind to settle down in the evening. They hang on. Their influence hangs on. So watch where you allow your mind to wander. Remember the consequences of your thoughts. You want to be thinking in a way that allows the mind to settle down easily, smoothly, at will. That means you have to be very strict in terms of sense restraint, and particularly restraint over the mind. Where you look, where you listen, why you look, why you listen. The choice there all comes from the mind. Ubaskagi makes this point. We talk about sense restraint. It's really mind restraint at the senses. When you can exercise restraint there, then you've got yourself protected. Then there's a simile of the cook. The cook is mindful to notice what his master likes, what food he likes, what food he praises, what food he reaches for. Sometimes the master doesn't say, but just shows by what he eats. If the cook notices, then he'll fix more of that food. If he doesn't notice, if he just keeps on fixing whatever he wants without paying attention to whether the person eating likes it or not, he's not going to get rewarded. So here's the message of the image. So you protect yourself by paying attention to what works and what doesn't work. You have to be observant. You may have read all kinds of things about what the meditation should be like. You may have a big fund of knowledge, but if you don't actually learn how to observe your mind to see what kind of breathing it likes, or if it doesn't like breathing to begin with, what other object you may focus on to get it to settle down. If you don't notice that, concentration won't come. So you protect yourself by being observant, watching your own actions, watching the results and learning to develop some skill. Think of John Lee's examples. You're learning to make clay tiles. In the beginning, you simply have to learn how to make them so they're strong and don't break, that you fire them properly. And that takes a lot of trial and error right there. And then once you've mastered that skill, then there are more. You can Try different shapes, different colors. Expand on your skill. But it all comes from being very observant of your clay and your sand and your water and the fire that you use to, to fire the clays. In other words, there's a lot that's going to have to be learned by looking at your own actions. Teachers can teach you only so much. The books can teach you only so much. Your real protection is that you're observant 
and you pay attention at the right spot, what you're doing and the results that you're getting. If you keep on thinking, well, people should be this way, people should be that way, or I should be able to say what I want and people should learn how to just accept that, you're never going to learn anything. You have to notice, if I speak in this way, act in this way, everybody gets upset, maybe I shouldn't speak and act in that way. Especially at a time like this when a sense of harmony in the group is really important. And the same principle applies inside. If focusing on one spot doesn't work, try another spot. Use your ingenuity. Be observant. That's how you protect yourself. And not only protect yourself, that's how your skill as a meditator grows. So the protection becomes more and more all around. And the meditation really does become your refuge. And you yourself become a person you can trust. <laughs>